Sure, I get upset sometimes. Driving in traffic makes me angry. Waiting in line annoys me. When my kids don't listen, that frustrates me. And my husband's stupid habits completely irritate me. Driving in traffic, waiting in line, not listening, stupid habits. Angry, annoyed, frustrated, irritated. Angry, annoyed, frustrated, irritated. You think these sins are avoidable? If you ask me, I think they're absolutely necessary. How dramatic. Well, good morning, and welcome to Retro Church. If you don't know me, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here. And if this is your first time with us, I just want you to know that we are so, so thankful that you made the decision to roll out of bed this morning early on a Saturday and come check out our church. I want you to know that we do not take that lightly. We understand that you have a lot of different options to choose from when it comes to the weekend, and so we're really glad that you're here. And if you are here, I want you to know that we believe that Jesus is everything that you're looking for, and our goal is to help you encounter him this morning. And so like Kelly said, we also have our fall festival today happening immediately after service. We are praying that the rain is going to hold out, uh, but if it is raining after service, we're going to move as much of that we can inside. And so our team does such a wonderful job planning these things. So can we just give it up for our events team? It is a lot of work to put all this stuff together. I'm just so grateful to get to do it with so many great people. So it's going to be awesome. And next week, we are beginning a brand new series called Modern Romance. And so we're going to be discussing relationships because how many of you guys know that relationships are complicated? Am I right? No one else wants to admit that the married people are like, no, mine's amazing. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but we're going to be diving into some topics like how do you know if the person that you're with is the one? Right? And can the Bible that's written so long ago, can it actually help relationships today? And this is going to be a conversation for everyone because we're going to be talking about being single, dating, and marriage. But for today, we are in our fourth and final part of this series, like you saw, called Necessary Sins. And I just got to know by a round of applause, has this helped anybody, this series so far? Yeah. I know there have been moments uh, that have been a little tense. Uh, I know that it's been some, some tough conversations that we talked about sinful stuff that, that God has been pulling out of us over the last three weeks. And I'm overjoyed to know that God has been using it to help deepen our faith and pull us into deeper waters of our faith. And so we've been talking about removing some sin. Right? Maybe it's some secret sin that we've kept from others. We've also talked about some sin that maybe we thought we didn't realize was actually a sin. And we even felt like these things were a regular, necessary part of our life. And so in week one, we discussed lying. In week two, we discussed gossip. And last week, we talked about lust. That was fun, wasn't it? Right? We talked about how God's intention for sex, what it was, and the context in which God created it for. And even though it might feel good in the moment, it actually creates a lot of damage. And so today, we're going to be talking about anger. And why are we talking about anger? Because like many of those other sins that we discussed, we can so often justify our anger. Like, well, if they didn't do it, then I wouldn't have reacted that way. Or if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have gotten so angry. Or we say things like, you know, this is just who I am. I've always been a hothead. And so our goal for today, like it's been all series, is to actually re remove the excuses, to go beyond the excuses and get to the root of the issue because the truth is feeling anger is not a sin. Feeling anger is not a sin. Getting upset with something when something bad happens is not a sin. That's normal. But where the sin can creep in is how we respond to that anger. Paul is speaking here to the Christians in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 26 and 27 and he says this, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. What I want you to notice is that Paul doesn't say that your anger is a sin. He says, in your anger, do not sin. What Paul means here is that when you're angry, don't give the devil an opportunity to manip manipulate you into sinning. Because when we have this unchecked anger in our hearts, the devil sees it as an open door to lead us into temptation. One of the very first stories in the Bible is about these two brothers named Cain and Abel. Now, if you don't know, Cain and Abel were actually Adam and Eve's sons. And what we're going to take a look at is how anger led to one of these sons doing something sinful. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 4, starting with verse 1. It says this. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. 
Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs of his flock. The Lord accepted Abel's gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. And now there's a whole other sermon in this scripture about tithing and giving and how we should give God our absolute best portions, but we're not going to go there today, okay? What, what I want you to know, what we should see here is that it's harvest time, right? And so out of gratitude and obedience, they would give back to God. And so Abel brought his offering, and it said that it was the best portions. But Cain did not offer his best, and therefore God did not accept his gift, which made Cain very angry. Notice he's mad at God for not accepting his gift, even though it's his own fault that he did not offer God his best. Because we know this, right? It's always easier to blame somebody else than it is to look in the mirror. Like, God, why won't you move in my life? Why won't you answer that prayer? And God's like, if you would actually give me your whole life, if you would give to me first and your best, that is what I can accept and that is what I can work with. And so the story goes on in verse 6. And the Lord's talking to Cain here and he says, why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. God asked Cain, hey, why are you so mad, bro? Like, if you would have made the right choice, if you would have done what is right, you would have been accepted. However, if you refuse to do what is right, if you make a bad judgment call in your anger, you better watch out because sin is crouching at your door. And what does it say that sin wants to do? It says that sin is eager to control you. And this was a wild thing for me to consider as I was preparing this. Like, some of us think that sin is just like something that I have, right? Or it's something that you do, but you have control over it. And I could could stop whenever I wanted. But on the contrary, the Bible says that sin controls us, which is why we need to avoid it. You guys with me so far? If we're being honest today, there are a few destructive ways that we could deal with our anger. The way I've heard it expressed is that there are two kinds of people when it comes to anger. There are stewers and there are spewers. And here's what this means. If you are a spewer, it means that you are quick to spew out words in anger. You are very expressive in your anger, and you're not afraid to let everybody know about it. Like when you're mad, you tend to explode. Anybody like this in the room? It's okay. You can admit it. All right. If that is you, let me read to you what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 11. It says this, fools vent their anger, but the wise quickly hold it back. That probably makes many of us fools, I would say, doesn't it? I played hockey uh, from the time I was a teenager until I was in my late 20s. Uh, When I was younger, I played some ice and roller hockey, and then as I got older, I played on a team uh, for deck hockey, which is on foot for the non-hockey people in the room. And I can remember this one particular game. We were a younger team of 20-somethings, and we were playing against guys who were in their 40s and 50s. And we were just like running circles around them because we were younger and faster, and they didn't like that. And so because they couldn't keep up with our speed, they started playing more physical. And so I have the ball, and I'm running up with my head down, And this guy hits me so hard, I'm not even kidding, he hit me so hard that my shoes fell off. (laughs) It was was like a cartoon where like I was running and I stopped but my shoes kept going. (laughs) And I remember getting up and saying all kinds of things that would make you not want to attend this church, but I wasn't a pastor back then so don't judge me. Uh, But when we're angry, we do and we say some stupid stuff, don't we? That's the epitome of Proverbs chapter 14 verse 17 where it says, a quick-tempered person does what? Foolish things. Foolish things. I hope that I am not alone. I'm not alone. We've all done and said some foolish things when we were angry. And this is what we call a spewer. And what happens when we're a spewer is we can leave a lot of damage in our wake. Right? When we vent our anger, it hurts people around us. Once we say things in anger, it is really hard to take it back, isn't it? And that's why God calls us to have self-control. And so some of us are spewers, and then there's some of us who are stewers. And what is a stewer? They are people who take their anger and they suppress it, right? Spewers express their anger, but stewers suppress their anger. And this is my wife, Caitlin. I don't know if this is like a general husband thing or if I'm just a special kind of stupid. Um, But I don't always see what my wife sees, right? There are things around the house that I don't think are that big of a deal that she does think are that big of a deal. And usually everything will be fine, Until one day, Caitlin will explode with this laundry list of things that I've either done or haven't done in the last month that has driven her crazy. All right, she has a habit of suppressing her anger and it eats her up inside until one day she explodes. Pray for us. But this kind of living, this is kind of how how King David felt here in Psalm 32 verse 3 when he says this. I kept silent 
My bones wasted away though my groaning, through my groaning all day long. Now, David, he's referring to a time when he kept quiet about the sin in his life, right? But similarly, he's saying, when I kept everything on the inside, when I suppressed my emotions, it made me feel horrible all day long. Some of you can relate to this. And so today, we're going to look at two different kinds of anger and see how we should deal with them in a biblical way. The first kind of anger we're going to look at is this, sinful anger, sinful anger. There's a story that we'd referred to before, uh, the story of the prodigal son, right? And it's one of the most famous parables that Jesus ever told. If you're not familiar with it, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus, he would use these life applicable examples to help people understand God and heaven. And so long story short, this son, he asks his father for his inheritance before his dad dies, and his dad gives it to him. And so the son, he takes the money, and he takes off, and he goes, and he blows it all on wild living, and he ends up running out of money. And when the money left, the friends left. When the money left, the women left. Everything left. He had nothing. And so he ends up working in a pig pen with nothing to eat, and he has this realization that the servants that work for his dad back home are living better than he is. And so he has this idea that he's going to go back to his father and go back to his dad's house, not as a son, but he would ask his dad, if I could just be a servant, could I just be one of your servants? And I'm summarizing here, but the son, he comes home, and instead of the father making him a servant, he hugs and kisses his son, throws a robe over him, puts a ring on his finger, and the father orders to have the fattened calf killed because they're going to throw a party for my son has come home. And it's a story that we, we champion in church because it truly is this incredible symbol of how in the same way God is like that with us. He is waiting for us to come home. But what we don't talk about often is that there's a whole other side of the story. You see, because there was another son. And this son, he didn't ask for his share of the inheritance. Instead, he stayed home like a good boy. Right? He did all the right things, and he served his father well and brought respect to the family name. And when he finds out that his low-life brother was getting this royal treatment, he was pissed. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 15. The older brother became angry, and he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. The Bible says that he refused to go in. Why? Because he was being a steward, right? He was suppressing and pushing down his feelings. And some of you are like this. When you push down your feelings, it makes you feel like maybe you're in control, but the truth is when you do that, it screws you up on the inside, right? And it always ends up coming out in the end anyway. And so if we're not supposed to spew it out, and we're not supposed to let it stew on the inside, then what are we supposed to do with our anger? The Bible, when referring to anger, refers to it metaphorically as fire 15 times. And so what do we know about fire? Right? We know that fire can be a great thing, and fire could also be a terrible thing. Right? I mean, we use fire to boil our water, to cook our food, to keep our homes warm. But on the flip side, fire can burn down forests. It could destroy homes and wildlife. Fire, on one hand, is very productive, but on the other hand, it's destructive. And it's the same thing with anger, friends. If anger, if sinful anger is a fire, then we have to figure out how to put it out. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14 says it this way. Starting a quarrel is like opening a floodgate, so stop before a dispute breaks out. We've all likely heard the saying about opening up the floodgates, right? But a floodgate is exactly what it sounds like. It's a gate that holds back water from flooding a specific area because if it were to flood, it would cause mass destruction. And so this says quarreling. A quarrel is a heated argument. A heated argument will open up the floodgates and create mass destruction to you and those around you. So we need to stop breaking out in disputes. And here's the thing. Many of us have something about us that, that we'll just dismiss like, well, that's just, that's just how God made me, right? And we could do this with anger. Like, I'm just an angry person, or I have a short fuse, or I'm Italian, so forget about it, okay? This is how God made me. And you're correct about one thing. God did make you, but he did not make you angry. We can't blame learned behavior on God. Let me say that again. We can't blame learned behavior on God. You have the ability to control it, but it will not always be easy. We live on Long Island, right? And so when someone cuts you off on the LIE, and now you are driving like you are the stunt driver in Fast and the Furious 17, trying to zip through traffic and catch up to them so you could what? Flip them off, right? Or right, maybe, maybe, just maybe, instead of that, Maybe you can learn to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they have something urgent or an emergency that they need to get to, and it might not be true, but I can promise you that it'll make you feel a lot better. 
Because even when you do flip that person off, has it ever actually made you feel better? Like, oh, I feel really glad that I got that off my chest. <laughs> no, it just adds to the turmoil inside of you, right? You're like playing conversations as if like, if we pull up to the same red light, I'm gonna, and then you do pull up to the same red light and you just keep looking straight because you're not that tough. I go, <laughs> what about that person at work or at school who does not stop talking? Meanwhile, you're like me. It's like, if I could just go to work and like keep my head down and not talk to anybody all day, like that is totally fine with me. So can you please just like get away from me? And the reality is they don't have any friends or their parents passed away and they don't have anyone to talk to at home. So work or school, it's their opportunity to have some human to human interaction. You see, we don't always know what's going on in the lives of those people around us. And so it would be beneficial to others and to ourselves if we would start giving people the benefit of the doubt. James chapter 1, verse 19 says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, if you don't know that word, everyone, do you know what it means? It means everyone. So now remember, James, he's the half-brother of Jesus, and what does he say we should do? He says that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And this is something that takes a lot of practice because if you're like me, I do the opposite. I'm slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry. And James says, no, 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 no. Everyone should be quick to what? Listen. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. And he tells us why we should do that. In verse 20, he says this, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Friends, when we are slow to anger, we are exhibiting a characteristic of our God. There are seven different books of the Bible that say that God is slow to anger. What it does not say is that God does not get angry. It says that he is slow to anger. Psalm 145, 8 and 9, it says that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And so let's strive to live a more holy life by training ourselves to be slow to anger and rich in love. And how do we do that? We do it by praying by asking God to guide us on the path of righteousness and holy living. Remember, to live a holy life means to live a life that is set apart. And I've repeated that all series because I want you guys to really retain this, that if someone asks you one day, what does it mean to be holy? It means that to be set apart. Again, we are called to live a holy life, set apart from the ways of this world. And so when, we, when the world is quick to get angry, when people around you say, aren't you, aren't you pissed off about that? People will see that there's something different about you because you've allowed God to guide you out of your anger and into the deep waters of his love. That is how we deal with sinful anger. The other kind of anger that we have to deal with is called righteous anger. Righteous anger. What is righteous anger? It's an anger that is stirred up over something that is morally wrong. And when we have a righteous anger inside of our bellies, those are the kinds of flames that we can fan, okay? We'd, we'd have to have some really big blinders on to not see that we live in this sinful, downright evil world, right? There's some terrible stuff going on. And what happens sometimes is we can get caught in these settings in church, like we're with other believers, and we say amen, and we applaud, and we, we sound like we're really rallying around each other. But then the second that we walk out those doors, we are back to the same old thing, and we don't really stand for anything, Right, we believe this whole God and Jesus thing, but we don't actually stand for the things that they stand for. In Mark chapter 3, there's a story about Jesus walking into the synagogue on a Sabbath. The Sabbath, it was a, a day of rest. And so with Jesus being there, the religious leaders, they wanted to catch him doing something on a day that everybody was supposed to re be resting from their work. And it says this, starting in verse 1, it'll be on the screens. It says, another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in what? Bring up the next slide. In anger. In anger. Phew. Okay, so... Jesus, you know, like the perfect son of God who never sinned. Like it says that he was angry, but it wasn't sinful anger. It was a righteous anger. It continues in verse 5, and it says, Deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. So it said that Jesus was angry with the religious leaders because their hardened and, and stubborn hearts 
that they would actually withhold a miracle of the Lord because it was the Sabbath. And he uses that anger for good because he followed that anger by healing a man's handicapped hand. For Jesus, it was healing this man's hand, but maybe for some of you, there's an injustice that just doesn't sit right with you, right? An injustice in this world that is a, a burden on your heart. And Jesus shows us that you can have this burning anger about something and yet respond to it without causing destruction. And we can actually have a righteous anger that produces healing and goodness. Maybe you're fed up with a flawed adoption or foster care child system. Maybe you're infuriated by racial injustices. Maybe you realize that sober houses really aren't what they say they are and you want to really help people. These are things that are worthy of being angry about. These are some of the things that break God's heart. And so what is it for you? Because if you're passionate about something, that didn't just happen. God put that in you. God put that in you, and it's an opportunity for you to use your anger to drive you to do something good for the glory of God and for the good of those around you. And perhaps the most intense thing is that we all, all of us, we all deserve God's anger. Do you know that? We all have sin in our life. We've all fallen short of God's standard daily, and it's that sin that separates us from God. Our sin, don't mistake it, our sin makes God angry. But instead of offering us his anger, he extends us grace. And he did this in the form of sending his son, Jesus. In the process, we've been saved from our sin. Our lives and our eternities, they've been changed forever. And now we have a new purpose to live here on earth. And because we've received that grace, we should be quick to extend it to others, friends. Because the unchurched world, they expect the church to meet them with anger and condemnation and judgment. And if you've experienced that in the church, I'm really sorry. I can promise you that we are not that church. We have an opportunity to show the world that that is not what Jesus is all about and instead extend them grace and mercy and love. And so at this time, our guest services team is going to be passing out communion. And wherever you're at this morning, you're invited to take one of the cups and we're going to talk about this. I think they're coming. Is Alexa in the room? Lisa, you on that? Thanks. So as we close out this series, what we all need to understand is that we all have a sin problem. We all have a sin problem. And there is no excuse that we have for any of it. And the Bible doesn't say that sin is bad. I'm sorry. The Bible... Hello. It doesn't say that it's only bad. It says that the cost of our sin is death. Is death. And we deserve to pay the price for our sins. But God in his goodness and his kindness and his mercy sent his one and only son, Jesus. And why did he do that? Because we're all sons and daughters. And it grieved him. It grieved God to be separated from each of us for eternity. See, God loves me and he loves each and every one of you so much that he sent Jesus who would go on to live a sinless life and die on a cross that he didn't deserve to be in. He did it in our place. And maybe today is the first day that you have this realization that it's true. Jesus died for you. Everybody say, he did it for me. You better say it like you mean it. He did it for me. If you've never heard this good news, it is an honor for me to share it with you today. Our entire faith, the entirety of Christianity is based on one thing, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. You see, if we just had the life and death of Jesus, that wouldn't really make him that special. But it's that last part, the resurrection that changed everything. You see, as I mentioned, we are all sinners. We all make mistakes in this life, and some we do intentionally, and some are by accident. But sin is sin, and in the same way that if a child makes a mistake or, or does something bad, their parents will forgive them and always love them. Hear me, that love and forgiveness is multiplied a million times over with God and you. Is that good news for anyone this morning? Four of you, great. I'll see the four of you in heaven. Regardless of what you've done, Regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you're even currently doing, God forgives you. He forgives you and loves you so much that he didn't just shout it down from heaven. He forgives you. And he sent his one and only son to leave heaven, by the way, and come down to earth to live like us. And Jesus' mission from birth was to die. And so when you think about what you are called to do and what your purpose is, Jesus' entire purpose was to die. And so why did he die? Because there was a price to pay for our sins. Our sins require a payment of death, of blood. 
and by worldly standards, we should die for our own sins. But God in his goodness said, I have a different plan. And he sent Jesus, who would be nailed by his hands and his feet on the cross, dying a brutal death in our place. And three days after, he was laid in that tomb, and he rose again, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And now because of that, the Bible says that anyone who believes in him will be saved. So as we take communion, we never do this as some like robotic religious act. We do it because Jesus commanded us to do it and that when we take it, we remember him. And so if you peel back that first layer of plastic, we'll take the bread together. And as we do, we remember Jesus' body that was whipped, beaten, and bloodied on his way to the cross. Peel back the second layer. We take the juice together. And as we do, we remember Jesus' blood that was spilled in our place for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus, we thank you. You didn't have to come down from heaven, but you willingly did the one and only son dying so that we can all be called sons and daughters. So we just thank you, God, for your goodness, for your mercy, for your forgiveness, that when we sin, either on purpose or accidentally because we don't know that it's sin or, or the world has called it not sin, God, that, that you're so patient with us. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for forgiving us, Lord God. We need you, Lord. We are nothing apart from you. And I pray today that, that people would encounter you, maybe for the first time. That regardless of where we walked in here today in our faith, that we would have been able to take our next step, whether it had been through the worship or, or through the word, Lord God. And I pray today that there are someone in this room that would be able to shed the shackles of, of anger, Lord God, that it, it probably hasn't felt like a big deal. Like, I'm just mad sometimes. But that there's a righteous way to deal with that anger. So I pray that you would just stir in our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you convict us when that anger does rise up to respond in a different way? Would you give us the ability to become more and more like Jesus? Because that's what we stand for. We pray all these things in his mighty name. Amen. I find it fitting that God would have us ending this service with a series called Make Room. Make Room. And the lyrics of the chorus of this next song simply say this. So I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. So this series has been fun, uh, it's been challenging, and maybe some of us have had our eyes open to some sin in our life that we didn't realize were that big of a deal when it comes to lying, gossip, lust, or anger. And so my hope is that the prayer of all of our hearts this morning would simply be this, God, I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. Whatever you want to. That means if there's some sin in my life, God, I give you permission to pull it out of me, even if it hurts a little bit. God, there's something that, if there's something that you need me to do, help me hear your voice and follow your call, God. I'm making room for you today so that you can have my life. Everybody say, I'm making room. Guys, we didn't start this church so that you could just learn more about God. We didn't start this church so that you could have more information on Jesus. We did it so that you can know Jesus, so that you can know God. Because as you get to know him, you'll realize that he is the source of everything you need. Purpose, love, kindness, affection, guidance, peace, joy. There's a reason that the Bible says that in Christ you are a new creation. Hear me, you can be made new this morning. The chains and the weight that you've been walking around with can be shaken free when you put your faith in and follow Jesus. You see, whether you're a Christian or not this morning, Jesus has never left you. You just never noticed him because a relationship is a two-way street. You have to say yes in response to what Jesus has done for you. And so if you want to respond to Jesus today, I want to give you that opportunity here this morning. So I'm going to invite everyone to stand at this time. And if you want to put your faith in Jesus for the first time and, and turn from your sin, the Bible says that when you call on Jesus' name, you will be saved. 
And so if that's you, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer this morning. And for the sake of those making the decision for the first time, I'm going to ask all of you to repeat this after me. And so with every eye closed and every head bowed, would everybody say, Jesus, I need you. I am a sinner in need of forgiveness. I believe you died and rose again for the forgiveness of my sins. Today I choose to turn from those sins and follow you. I commit my life to you in Jesus' name. With every eye still closed and every head still bowed, if you're here this morning and you say, I want to make that decision for the first time. I want to put my faith in Jesus and follow him. I want to turn from my sins and I might not have the answers to all of these things, but I need help and I want to take my first step toward Jesus today. If that's you, would you just look up and make eye contact with me so I can see you? I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you guys. I see you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that this is a safe haven for sinners to come and not feel shamed or burdened by their sin, but knowing that they have a Savior that loves them and that you've equipped us to be a church that can show them that kind of love that we don't have to come here and fake it till we make it, that we don't need to come here and pretend like we're all holy high rollers and look at us and how great we are and how we follow Jesus. We all have sin in our life. From the pastor to the greeter to the worship team to the production team to the person who just walked in here for the first time, we've all got sin that we struggle with. And so none of us are perfect. And that's why we pursue Christ, the one who was perfection. And so I pray today for those that have made the decision for the first time that you would just continue to stir in their hearts, Lord God, and that today wouldn't have been some emotional experience that they had, but that they would continue to pursue you. And maybe it just starts like coming to church every week, committing to that, and then deepening their faith by reading your word or or praying more, Lord God, or, or extending in worship in their car even, God. Would you equip us to be a church to help rally around each other, to walk side by side on this journey and say, we're going together. And I might be a few steps ahead on the journey, Lord God, but we are all headed in the same direction towards you. And so would you help us be a church to seek after the lost? Because like that that father in the story of the prodigal son, you are waiting for your children to return back home. And what an honor it is to be a church that could be a lighthouse to point in your direction. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that you would choose screwed up people like us to bring forth your word and tell the good news of the gospel. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.